Last week we uh, began a series, Knowing God, Knowing God, and we've done two parts of the series last week, in the morning and then in the evening. just want to encourage you, if you've never been to an evening service, come, the whole thing's different. 6 p.m. service is different. It's for those who haven't had enough yet, want to draw off the Lord a bit more. And uh, we had a great time last Sunday night. Power of the Lord moved, even though someone was trying to get on me. And um, <laughs> we had a blast in the Holy Ghost. Excellent. So we're up to Knowing God, Part 3. Knowing God, Part 3. So if you've got your Bibles, let's turn to our base scripture here in John chapter 17 and verse 1. John chapter 17 and verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, we've got some down the back there. Just raise your hands and you can borrow one of ours. John chapter 17 and verse 1. And it reads, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. This is quite an interesting chapter because uh, there's, there's not many times where we actually get to see Jesus praying to Father God. Usually he says he, uh, he went by himself up the mountain to pray. And that's all we ever hear of it. And so this time it's explicit. John the Apostle has, has written down some details of what Jesus was actually praying. And so he says, The Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh that he should ha give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you. That he should give eternal life to as many as as you have given him. And so knowing God and eternal life are synonymous. Synonymous. Eternal life and knowing God are synonymous. And so we've been looking at some issues about uh, what it means to know Father God. Um, and one thing that we covered last week is that uh, knowledge since we were born was determined by our five senses. We are born into the sense realm and our understanding of the wor world is gauged by what we can see, what we can smell, what we can hear, what we can taste and touch. We know gravity begins to work when we jump off the bed and land awkwardly on the ground. And so we begin to understand that, that you know, we, we avoid the holes in the ground now because we understand if we try and walk over the top of it, we'd fall into it. And so our understanding of the world is through our five senses. But being born again, there is this new reality to us, this new realm that has been revealed to us, and it's not determined by our senses. And so there lies the conundrum. There lies this disparity of us trying to understand and know some of the spiritual things that are outside our five senses. And we have to walk with God in this life through faith. You can't do this without it. This new way of obtaining knowledge develops and, th and then adds to you. There, there, sometimes there is just some things now that you know that you know that you know. And it's not based on what you see, hear, smell, taste, touch. You can uh, have an interaction with somebody and you can walk away and go, there's just something not right. And it's not based on your five senses. It's based on something deeper. And so we're looking at this together, what it means what this means, and how we can come to know Father God. And so last Sunday night, um, we can know God through being partakers of his divine nature. Being partakers of his divine nature. And so when you demonstrate different graces, when you demonstrate faith, righteousness, justice, when you demonstrate... Or uh, you may even forgive somebody that doesn't even deserve to be forgiven. You partake of his divine nature. I gave a, a, an example. My wife and I, I, do, I was just compelled to pray for this girl. Um, her mother was telling us the day before that she had a brain aneurysm and she was about to give birth. So stress levels in that household was high. And uh, I just had compassion come on the inside. And so I said, when they turned up to our driveway... Uh, a few years back, 
We just asked her. We don't even know. It's the first time she met us. We says, hey, can we pray for you? Can we pray for you? And so we managed to pray for her, and uh, it was a really amazing moment. But when I came away from that, having partaken of God's divine nature, I knew a little bit more about the love of God that day. And so when you demonstrate God's, God's graces to others, it uh, could be through hospitality, brotherly kindness, you could uh, pray for healing for somebody or demonstrate the love of God to someone, then you too partake of God's divine nature. And so you begin to understand and know who Father God is by partaking of his divine nature. If you need any more clarification on that, you probably should have been here last Sunday night. But you can go back and watch on Facebook um, part two. YouTube. All right, so uh, we're moving on. So we're going to be looking at uh, knowing God through abiding. Chapter 17, so let's jump down now to verse 20. Follow me with your, uh, in your word. Verse 20. So now Jesus is praying for all believers. So uh, in, in the, the 17th chapter of John, Jesus is praying for, uh, firstly, he prays for himself. You know, and it's a good practice to pray for yourself. And for you. Yes. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. So what Jesus is praying here is this, this form of unity. There is this greater sense of unity, that I in you, and you in me. Jesus was talking about this kind of, this unity that he has with the Father, with Father God. Some of the disciples says, show us the Father. Then we'll believe. Show us what he looks like. Open up the heavens and, 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 and let, us, let us see him. Jesus says this, if, you, if you've seen me, you've seen him. I don't do anything on my own accord. Everything I do is of Father God. Everything that I say is of Father God. If you've heard me and you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. I can't think of any other better demonstration of unity than that. And so this is what Jesus is praying over all believers. Just as, as I and you and you and me, Father God, I pray for that kind of level of unity for all believers. That they come together to be as one. Yes. And that's a powerful, powerful thing. <laughs> Now that they may be one, they may have this unity in us. Now this is quite interesting because there was another time when mankind was one and they were powerful. Can anyone kind of give me a... The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. All of mankind was one and they wanted to build a tower up to heaven. And that... Asking for directions. Don't say towel ringer. <laughs> okay, so we confused their different languages. And so they, they, the Tower of Babel ceased to, because they couldn't communicate anymore. It was like, well, if, God, if Jesus is praying for unity, how come he didn't allow that to happen? It's because they were one without him. They were doing things without God. And even though they were powerful, it wasn't God's plan for mankind's life. And if they, were, if they were wanting to build a, 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 uh, a tower to heaven and it got God's attention, I'm thinking they probably, probably could have done it. How freaky would that be? But here's the cool thing, is that now Jesus is praying for unity in God. And the way that he's done that is also through different tongues. 
those who are spirit-filled believers with the evidence of speaking in tongues, it binds us together. It unifies us. I, will, I can speak in a tongue and then somebody else will interpret it. Therefore, there is a unity there. We're working together. You understand what I'm saying? And so this is what Jesus is praying for. He's not praying for just unity of, the ma of mankind. He's praying for unity of the believers. So we're praying for unity for the believers in him. And so God divided man by mixing his tongue, but now his tongues is what unifies or unites the spiritful believers. Are you with me? All right. So let's have a look at this example here in Acts chapter 4 and verse 21. Acts chapter 4 and verse 21. All right, Acts chapter 4 and verse 21. So just a, uh, I'll give you a bit of a background here. Um, Peter and John went up to the temple to pray. And there was this man who was begging and he was lame from, his, uh, from birth. They just carried him out there and dumped him at the, at the gate of the temple. And so he had asked alms from anybody who would pass by. And Peter and John happened to go up to the temple to pray. And so... It caught their attention. He says, I want you to look at us. And so the, the lame man looked at them and he says, Silver or gold, I have none. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And this man was miraculously healed. Miraculously. The charge in the ear of the anointing to heal at that time was, was powerful. There was no kind of, um, I've seen mir miraculous healings where people have been pulled out of wheelchairs and stuff, and it takes them a while to kind of get their legs sorted out because they haven't used them. The muscles are sore and the muscles are weak. But here, they just went to, he went straight to running and leaping and praising God. He was just like, boff, his, it's probably the greatest thing he could ever feel was just this freedom to move and not be carried around and be dependent on strangers. He was now mobile. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so this, t this hacked off the Pharisees, would you believe, the religious folks. And so they, they, they captured the two apostles, and they had them before the Sanhedrin, and they says, look, you guys can't keep doing this. You can't keep preaching in the name of Jesus. And they says, look, who are we to obey, man or God? And so they threatened them, and they let them go. So this is where we're up to. They threatened these guys, and they let them go. So verse 21, and so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them. This is in verse 21, because of the people, since they all glorified God what had been done. So they were afraid of the people. Verse 22, for the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders said to them. So when they heard, they raised their voice to God with... One accord. They were one. And said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? Kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For, short, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. I'm looking forward to those prayer meetings to come. come on. If there was an earthquake that ripped through here, you know what? I'll be, I wouldn't be running for the frames. I'd be praising God. <laughs> And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who were of one heart and one soul, neither did anyone say any of the things he possessed was his own, but had all things in common, and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace, which is an empowerment, was upon them all. 
nor was there any of them who lacked, for all that had possess possessors of lands and ha houses sold them and brought all the proceeds to those things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. <laughs> I like this. Now, I'm not saying for you to go out there and sell all your stuff and then bring them and lay them. I wouldn't know what to do with the money. And uh, I was listening to Jesse DePlantis um, yesterday, and um, he was talking about... Um, the rapture. He was talking about the time where the, the Lord was going to come and take us up to up to heaven. And he was talking about it. You know, uh, he, he had, you know, he's he was well off. He's a nice big house, and uh, he actually gets he gets run through the mud many times because of the things that he has. And um, I just like to f put it this way: you can't judge a man's harvest until you've seen his seed. You don't hear the stories where the kids have come home and there's no, there, there is no couches. There is no furniture because he's given it all away. So you can't judge a man's harvest until you've seen the seed that he's sown in his life. And if, uh, if God's glory is going to come on the finances of the believers, you have to ask yourself, well, what's that going to look like? So anyway, he's talking about his, his house and his, and his stuff, and he goes, Lord, do you, do, you, you know, do you want me to just sell a whole lot and, you know, and, and you know, put it towards outreach so we can you know, go and save save the city and, and save as many people as we can. And he says, no, you need to keep your stuff for when you come back. And he goes, well, what do you mean? Your material possessions that you will have here on the earth, you will come back for them. See, the rapture of the church will be those that are, are, are going to be raptured, but it's taken away for seven years. And he says, I want you to ring your lawyer. And he goes, well, what for? Just ring him. He goes, okay. He brings him up. And he doesn't even know why he's ringing his lawyer up. He goes, hey, Jesse, how are you going? He goes, yeah, yeah, good, I'm good. Um, and so he's sitting there and he goes, come on, Lord, come on the phone. What do you want me to say? And he goes, ask him what would happen if you go missing to all your possessions. And so he, uh, he goes, okay, so theoretically speaking, if I happen to go missing, what will happen to all the possessions that I have? And he says, well, if you go missing and no one can find you, you can't be pronounced dead until seven years. <laughs> so we'll come back for your stuff. Anyway, that was a site. That was for free. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about this, this morning. Okay, so... Where are we up to? Here we go. So verse 34, Nor was there any one of them who lacked for all were possessors of the lands and houses and sold them. So what we see here is that they, they couldn't care less about their, their, their worldly possessions. They, they thought about the people's souls and the, and the well-being of, of each other and the believers. And that was a powerful, powerful thing. And the proceeds of, them, uh, of the things were sold. They laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated the son of encouragement, the Levite, of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and bought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so we see this, there is this movement happening. They were in unity and they had great power. And uh, God blessed that. There is a, a, a blessing that God has reserved for those that come together corporately versus by yourself. The most powerful times that I've had before the Lord on the altar of God is when I'm surrounded by young guys that uh, have this heart of wanting God to move. I've never sensed anything like it. Because we're of one heart, one soul. We're abiding together and God moves on us. So there is something powerful when the brethren come together in unity and abide together. There is something powerful. All right, so we're just going to uh, put the brakes on there, and I want us to turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse 1. 
says, I, so this is in red. So if the letters are in red, what does that mean? Jesus is speaking. Very good. All right, so Jesus is speaking and he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So it says here, Jesus is the true vine and father God, some other translations use the word, um, so we've got vine dresser here, but also uses the word husbandman or farmer. So husbandman or farmer. And the only way you will ever get tended to by Father God is through the one true vine, which is Jesus. There is no other way to Father God. John 14 verse 6 says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. There is no way, no how, no access to God and you know what? Uh, the big time preachers, when they're questioned by this by the world, some of them struggle with this kind of stuff, especially the younger ones. They struggle in saying Jesus is the only way. So many like people like Oprah Winfrey, for instance, and, and some other people that interview others, they, they say, no, there's many ways to God. There's many ways, but there isn't. Clear as, written in red, I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's good that we are clear, clear with, with truth. There is no multiple truths. There is only one truth. Praise the Lord. Yeah. All right, so. Uh, and it says here that anyone that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Fruitfulness is a expectation on your life. God is expecting fruit from your life. It's quite interesting um, when you look at the parable of the talents. He talks about that the, the landowner, he goes away and he leaves his servants some, some talents. He leaves one with five talents, he leaves one with two talents and he leaves on with one talent and he expects them to be fruitful when I come back go out and do what's necessary that you increase now of course when, the, uh, when he came back at a time that's not known the one that had five talents was able to say look I've, I've produced more, five more talents he's ten I've doubled well well done good and faithful servant come in and share in your master's happiness Fought uh, the two talents, bought another two talents. Look, master, you've given me two talents. I've increased by another two talents. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come in and share in your master's happiness. But the person with the one talent went out and buried it. He had to apply effort not to increase. He, he had to squash what was kind of God-given grace on his life to increase by hiding it because it got into fear, doubt, and unbelief. And he goes, you wicked and <laughs> you wicked and lazy servant. And so there is this fruitfulness that is required on our lives. It's a, there is an expectation. And if not, there are severe consequences. So in God, you have to apply effort not to increase. That is who God is. God increases. Wherever he is, he increases, he multiplies, he is fruitful. If God is in your life, then you are primed to increase. We have never been so well off. <laughs> My family and I, well, you know, in comparison to the world, you know, we're not like Elon Musk, for instance. Who, but we are, we, we are financially free. And so verse, let's have a look at verse 3. So I, verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Oh, praise Lord for the pruning. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. 
Now verse 4, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Without me you can do nothing. Now that word abide is the Greek word meno, which means to stay. In a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. To remain, dwell, continue, be present. (laughs) You are present here right now. You are in a good space. You are in a good place. You want to continue. You want to stay. You want to be with God. And so we allow God to be your source. He is the giver of good gifts. He is our Jehovah Jireh. We cannot detach ourselves from Jesus thinking that we can be fruitful. Ephesians 1 verses 22. I just, uh, just have a look at this. Uh, just write it down. I'll read it to you. Ephesians 1 verses 22. Got a couple of translations here. And it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. Who fills all in all. And New Living Translation says this, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Now if you look at the natural body, for instance, how does the natural body get sustenance? Through the head. Through the food. It gets sustenance. In fact, your, be- your head is, is pretty much the, the main frame of what your body does. What it eats, how much it exercises, now, as we liken it here in, in this para, is that Jesus is the head of the church. And he fills all in all. So whether you're called to be a finger, whether you're called to be a hand, whether you're called to be a bicep or an elbow, wherever you are in the body of Christ, stick with the head. You can't, I can't chop this finger off and say, go and be fruitful. It'll just lie on the floor for a little bit. And then it'll just perish and die. It needs to be attached to the body. <laughs> so Jesus, the head of the church, fills the church with and through himself. Just like naturally, the head feeds the body. So the key is to abide in God. Stay with him. I don't know about you, sometimes we meet uh, believers who used to come here backslidden, and you have this kind of awkward, <laughs> I don't know how you feel about it, but there's this kind of awkward interaction about, okay, what are we talk? you're so passionate about God because you love God because you're present in, in, in God and you want to tell them all about the good things God's doing, and then at the same time you're thinking, so here's a key question that I, I kind of, if you have the courage to ask, because sometimes they talk about negatively about church. Church doesn't do this, church doesn't do that, uh, the people are unfriendly, they leave you out, blah, 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 heard it all. And so let's, so here's a question that I, I would put to them, I, I'd put church aside for a second and, and you can ask this question, are you far from him? Let's just put church aside for a little bit. Where are you with him? Are you far from God? Because it's not God that's backstabbed them and talked bad about them. and It's not God who's kind of... Are you far from him? Verse 6, If anyone who does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. So that's some pretty severe consequences. So there are people out there who do not abide. There are the obvious ones, the backsliders and the rebellious. (laughs) 
they're just you know some of the some of the worst people out there they do the 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 the, the craziest sinning uh, backslidden Christians it's like they're just full on rebel and and do what you know do what a, do, they'll go to the extreme but here is uh, I just want to address this there's um there's the not so obvious of those who, do, who don't abide. They're not so obvious. And these are the people that live in disobedience. I heard of this instance, this guy, he refused God 20 years because he thought God was calling him to China. He says, nope, I'm not doing it. And he just lived this half-life of Christianity, too afraid to go to, before God and, and ask God about some serious things or even to just to grow it, grow it. And then finally, after 20 years, he just decides to... He couldn't do it anymore. He couldn't just sit in church here and, and just live with this guilt of not submitting to God. So finally he submits to God and says, Lord, if you want me to go to China, I'll go to China. God says, I don't want you to go to China. I just want you to be willing. I just want you to be willing. The Word talks about this. There are some that take the form of godliness but deny the power thereof. There is a silent unabiding and it hides behind a facade. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees in Matthew 15 verses 8 to 9. I'll just read it to you. It says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And people can disconnect in their hearts, but they carry on as if nothing's happened. A disconnect. It's quite interesting. Um, Israel, during the Exodus, stood at a crossroads with God. And God had a guts for He says, you know what? This is a stiff-necked, complaining, murmuring people. I can't walk with them anymore just in case I burn them up with my wrath. Yeah. And I says, I'll tell you what. I am a keeper of my word. You will carry on to the, uh, to the promised land because I do what I say. Otherwise, I will be a liar, and I'm not a liar. And he says, but I'm going to let an angel go before you. I'm not coming. And unfortunately, there's many people in the church that just says, oh, yep, okay, let's do it. An angel's good. Let's just get us to the promised land. Make us look like we're believers. Make us look like we're, we're doing the right thing. We don't really need the presence of God. But Moses says this. He says, you know what? If you're not going with us, then we're not going. We'll stay here. Let's just figure this out. I know you're upset with us. <laughs> Rightfully so. It's quite interesting. Some of the dialogue between Moses and God, he goes, these are your people. And Moses is like, no, no, these are your people. I was minding my own business out there farming out in the, in the wop wop somewhere, and you came and got me to come and get these people. They're your people. Imagine being one of the Israelites hearing that conversation. Got to make you feel good. <laughs> feel the burn. But people can do the same thing every week here at church. There's a disconnect on the inside where things, we just put this front on. Looks like everything's all, all good. And yet our connection with God has somehow disconnected. Sometimes God will ask you to do things to, and even though the uncomfortability of it or the, the challenge of it can be quite a lot for some. But that's where he is. That's where his presence abides. I remember early on in my walk with the Lord, I'm sitting here and I was, and I was listening to a preacher talking about forgiveness. And, he's, and he looked into the crowd and he says, you know, I want you to look into your heart right now and I want you to picture somebody that you have unforgiveness for. And straight away my stepdad just came up. And I knew it. He says, now's the time to forgive. And I knew that's where his presence abided. Was, this, was in this act of obedience to forgive my stepfather. But when you refuse that, when you refuse it, and he says, no, he's done too much things wrong. 
There's too much abuse with me and my brothers, and there's too much of this and too much of that. I, I just can't do it. Then there is a disconnect that happens. There has to be an abiding. And so, praise the Lord, I, I, through the love of God, you can't do, you can't, you can't forgive people that have traumatically hurt you. In your own strength, you have to do it with the love of the Lord. And even if it's the hardest thing in the world, you just get before God and just say, Lord, I can't do this by myself. I need you to help me. And you walk, you walk it out, and that's where he is. You abide in his presence. So I continued to walk with him. Continued to be attached to the vine. I continued to walk in his graces. To abide. So what does it mean to abide? What does it mean to abide? Like actually. What does it look like actually? Um, I've shared this a number of times, but uh, early 2019 was probably the most challenging time for me as a minister of the gospel. I've only been, <laughs> only been pastoring for one year. But we had three, three funerals in a row of, of people... Um, a uh, number of them were, were, were close to us. And as a, as a pastor of the church, you have to have it together because the families need you to have it sorted out. But my heart was hurting too. I wanted to grieve too. I wanted to, to feel the loss and to mourn. But you can't. You cannot. You have, there, there is a place where you, you just have to keep it together for the sake of the people. And that, that's the cost of leadership. It's a high price. I was at a uh, minister's association meeting last week, and, and they, the ministers were talking about that. You know, where is the, how do, how do, who do they talk to about wanting to vent about stuff that happens? I mean, you, they get dumped on... And so, this, this, so when this happened, I um, praise the Lord. The God, God is so good to me. I, I really am the golden child of heaven. <laughs> he looks favorably upon me, and I just receive it. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not shy. God is good to me. Um, praise the Lord. And so... I came, to, I came to this point where I was thinking, God, where, where do, how do I deal with this? How am I supposed to keep it together when I too want to, want to mourn and, and feel the loss of, of these people? He said this. He said these words. Come to my secret place. Come to my secret place. And I, I've heard the secret place before. So I looked up in the Word. <laughs> it's a good place to go. Looked it up in the Word. So turn with me to Psalm 91. I want to show you some things in here that just really bless my heart. And this will keep you too. Psalm 91 is a famous psalm that we stand on, especially in times like COVID and a worldwide pandemic. Psalm 91. So it says this, He who dwells where in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Now this is the cool part about the word abide here. In the Hebrew, the word abide means loon. L-U-W-N, loon. And it means this, to stay to lodge, to be obstinate. And here's some other words. This, this word loon is so packed. It is, for such a four, short four-letter word, um, it, has a lot of, it carries a lot of weight. So it says to stay, to obstinate, to lodge. But it says this, to complain, <laughs> to murmur, to grudge. This doesn't sound like a Christian leader. To, to complain, to murmur, to grudge, then it says to tarry, then to endure, then to continue. 
Now, all these words don't seem to kind of match up together, but this is what the word loon means. And they all connect. So here in the secret place, I was able to complain to God about stuff. I was able to vent. I was able to murmur. I was able to grudge. But I tarried for a little while. Then I saw that I was able to endure. Then I'm able to continue. Come and abide with me, saith the Lord. So where do leaders get to mourn? Where do leaders get to complain and about their hardships? Here in the secret place. Here in the secret place. The secret place is the most inner place of Father God and that's only afforded to the sons of God and daughters. You are covered and protected here by his wings. It is a refuge. You are shielded. If you read all of Psalm 91 here, it gives you a description. You're also guarded by angels. Isn't that awesome? It's like a secret place where you can just come in and let go. Oh, God. Why is this happening? You can read it with David. If David goes, oh, I'm surrounded by my enemies. They laugh and they mock me. He's in the secret place. Venting, complaining, murmuring. But God is so gracious, he's able to kind of hold you in that. Until you're able to endure. See it from his perspective. And then continue. Because you are partaking in his divine nature. Are you with me? So here is where you lodge to complain, to murmur, to talk about your grudges. I mean, <laughs> had a fallout with my principal. I was a sister principal. Had a fallout with my principal about timetabling. It wasn't actually a big deal. I think I was just being a baby. But I, instead of having to go at him at, at the office, I just held my tongue. Because Pastor Colin, I'm trained, I've been trained very well. So I held my tongue. And then I got into the car and I let God have it. Complained, murmured, grudged. About 15 minutes into, into my spat, God graciously made me see it from his perspective and that I was wrong and that he was right. That I was wrong and he was right. There are not many people out there that are able to accept that they were wrong. But a... Um, oh, it's lovely. Lovely sound in the house. But when I was able to come back there and I was able to walk into the office and I said, you know what, you were, you were right about that. I'm really... Let's do this, you and I. And that, that, that kind of... Uh, uh, the world doesn't get to experience that much. So if a leader, you cannot afford to wear your heart on your sleeve sometimes. Can't do it. I remember listening, uh, you know, God shows me some things. I was watching Men in Black. Uh, if you don't know what Men in Black is, it's a movie about they're a secret um, defense force against alien invasions. And so um, they're training up this young guy. There's Will Smith in there. Um, he, he reveals his weapon in front of everybody and, and blasts and tries to shoot at this alien who's escaping, who's, who's dressed as a human. And the older guy puts his weapon down and he goes, stop. And he goes, you've just revealed your weapon to, to, to the public. And he goes, you don't understand. We're about to be uh, invaded by something. And he goes, there is always an invasion. There is always a, a threat to the world. And the only way that these people can carry on with their lives is if they just don't know about it. And the Lord, the Lord spoke to me. He goes, you know what? There, there's a price to leadership sometimes. Sometimes the way that people just carry on is when they just don't know about some things. And that's when the shepherd is, is supposed to go before God. I can't tell you everything that happens here. There is a covering that I have a responsibility for. But I have the secret place where I can vent and <laughs> get angry and I'm not saying 
Now, please hear me. You might be thinking, far out. Is, is Raymond Family Church really hard to, to manage? Not. You guys are like the best church in the world. Amen. I end up in, in all these different pastors' meetings, and they're talking about all their hardships and stuff, and I'm just like scratching my head going, am I in the right place? Or, my church is awesome. And, and you almost... I said to Pastor Colin the other day, I said, you almost feel ashamed talking about how awesome our church is. And he goes, there is nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> but so there, there are times when you do need to abide. And when you abide, it's when you begin to know Father God. Are you with me? All right, let's uh, have a look at the scripture in closing and then we'll... Praise the Lord, then we'll call it a day. 1 John 2, verse Okay, 1 John 2 and verse 24, it says, Therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. Hold fast to the truth. Hold fast to Jesus. Don't let anybody talk you out of him. And this is the promise that he promised us is eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do, not need to te- you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Verse 28, Now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we have the confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you abide in God... Your whole life, the rapture of the church isn't, is just going to be a walking over. It's, it's not going to be this kind of all of a sudden like, whoa, and you, everyone's surprised and you know, we're, we're floating up in the air and we don't kind of understand what's happening. You will know him. You will know what his presence feels like. You know what his voice sounds like. My shepherd know my voice. My sheep, sorry, know my voice. I am the good shepherd. You understand what I'm saying? And so when you're abiding in God's presence, your whole life, it is just a stepping over. When he comes for us, it will just be a stepping over. Praise the Lord. And like like Jesse was saying, don't worry about your positions because we'll come back for it in seven years. (laughs) Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for your word. It is health and life to us. Keeping of it, there is great reward. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for you are truly the good vine. We are found in you, Lord. We are found connected to the one true vine. And Father, God is our vine dresser. And Father, we just thank you, Lord. We purpose in ourselves to abide in you, to be in your presence good times and bad times we thank you for your secret place and Lord I just thank you for a blessing on this people Lord God I just thank you Father for your hand upon our lives where you are leading us on and leading us into and we thank you that the more that we know you the more that we know eternal life and we thank you for it right now in Jesus name Amen